Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, October 7th, and this is the weekly market report. A disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. A couple things uh, before we get started. Um, I have, of course, published the weekly market update with the on via podcast uh, forums or uh, platforms. Uh, I would ask if you are listening to this on a podcast format, if you could go in and uh, give it whatever kind of rating, you know, hopefully positive rating uh, would help the channel. If there's some kind of way to like it or whatever, that would be very good. You know, uh, since I've shifted everything, uh, you know, I'm, I'm incurring more expenses. So I would like to grow the, the, um, the audience. Uh, we, we are back on Spotify. This uh, podcast uh, medium I use Podbean does publish it out to the various uh, platforms um, so I'm trying to increase it and meet the requirements to get it on more and more platforms. So however you choose to listen to it, uh, if you could help me out, that would be great. Also, uh, you know, we've had tremendous support here on YouTube and on Twitter. And so, uh, again, like, share, comment, um, uh, if you're so inclined, uh, so let's get into this week's information. So, you know, we had the employment report and it was pretty good, decent. Uh, I didn't delve into the um, details of it. Suffice to say that, you know, my view on this whole uh, economy, economic um, expansion slash recession argument that as long as employment's been holding up, then consumer spending will likely hold up and we won't uh, enter a recession. However, I just keep seeing more and more data points that indicate to me that, you know, we're going to be rolling over. And, you know, most of this is due to the cost of credit going up by the, obviously the Federal Reserve uh, raising rates. And then of course, all rates across the board go up, which reduces bank lending. And because this is a credit-based economy, well, you know the whole spiel. We've been through it before many times. And so one of the things that we've been saying, that I've been saying is it, this lag effect is um, not fully kicked in. We haven't seen the effect of all of the previous rate raising cycle. And so when you compound this now with a situation where the U.S. debt's getting out of control and rates are being forced up to some extent by the inability of the treasury to sell its debt, uh, especially to foreign governments that used to buy it because of uh, uh, some of the geopolitical uh, positions that the United States has taken. So rates are higher and this is not good for a credit-based indebted economy like the United States. And so again, you know, it's taking longer. As I've said, I said on another, somebody interviewed me this week or last week, and I said this something similar to what I'm getting ready to say now. You know, these things, when you're making these forecasts, a lot of times these things take longer. Uh, even, you know, when we're looking at specific industries or stocks, things usually take longer than you anticipate uh, for various unforeseen reasons. But I think that uh, the fishers and the, and the rumblings of the earthquakes, many earthquakes continue to happen, and it's just a matter of time before uh, this particular economic volcano explodes uh, to the downside. So uh, here's uh, some more information. You know, trucking employment is falling off a cliff. If you look at the previous times when uh, trucking employment has decreased substantially, that was during uh, recessions. Uh, you see how it's turned down recently. Uh, it cannot be positive uh, based on previous, um, you know, 
times when this is something similar has happened. So just another, it's not it's just one single data point among many, but uh, when I look at these like headline numbers on employment, I, I go a little bit deeper. I look at the ADP, I look at the challenger um, layoffs. I look at the small business. There's a paycheck small business employment indicator. These are not positive. They're not going in the right direction. And so you have to wonder, you know, as, uh, and I'll get into some other slides, which makes me think that, you know, we're getting to this inflection point where unemployment is going to start rising. And if, if, and when that happens, that will be the final stool that's, or leg that's kicked out from the stool. Um, and uh, then we could see that ripple through other things like, you know, people's ability to service their debt, personal debt, auto loans, mortgages, things like that, which will contribute again to lower consumer spending because it's a consumer-based economy. Well, you, you get the point. We see here that uh, this year, small business bankruptcies are up. Um, you see that there's a little bit of a kind of a corollary where previous, um, even during the pandemic, uh, we didn't see too bad of a, you know, this, I guess we, what I'm saying is which one of these is not like the others in 2023, when we're supposedly in this recovery, supposedly things are fine, but yet we have uh, small business bankruptcies exceeding the last three years, which were during the, during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. So uh, food for thought, and that's another data point. I like this chart. This is a uh, Crestcat Capital. I really like their like they do it every Friday or every other Friday. The, uh, they have a webinar where they talk about various macroeconomic themes and themes specific to precious metals or their investment themes. Uh, they also uh, go over various uh, companies that they are participating in private placements in the uh, gold and resource junior market. Very interesting and worthwhile to watch. I uh, take a lot of notes during those, but these charts that they put out are very, very good. Um, and, and I find them very useful and eye-opening. This is the uh, NASDAQ versus Treasuries. You can see that, well, again, I'm just posting the chart. I don't have the data. I didn't go back and look for the last 20 years what the correlation was, but you can see a pretty tight correlation between the... Um, NASDAQ and treasury prices or and you can see that as treasury prices decrease as bond yields go up um, in the past that has led to weaker stock prices but we have this different we have this bifurcation that happened earlier this year and as treasury uh, prices the price of bonds decrease again as rates go up um, we we see the um, NASDAQ has diverged and we see, is it starting to break down? I don't know. I just point this out because this is, you know, why, again, I go back to the same view, even though bonds have been down um, three years in a row, which I think is unprecedented. Um, and so people are, have been trying to front run and get, and they know that eventually we're going to go to another rate cutting cycle. So they're trying to front run the Fed and they keep getting taken out on stretchers. I mean, I have i don't see any reason why you need to go out on the long dated, you know, way out in 10 and 30 years trying to lock in some rates and then get some capital gains when the Fed cuts rates eventually. Um, but uh, when you can just get over 5% in short-term treasury bills, you don't get the fluctuation in price. Okay, I'm not going to get into, somebody asked me to do a discussion around bonds and how they work and, uh, direct. you know, I guess I could do something in the newsletter because I think there will be some opportunities over the next, you know, year to 18 months. Uh, so explaining, I didn't realize, well, I should have, but there's a lot of, uh, let's say people just aren't educated on how bonds work. They do represent excellent opportunities at some point that will become a blown out asset. And uh, I'm speaking speci specifically to the corporate high yield market at some point, um, at least if uh, things follow through. Um, what I think 
you know, this is just kind of running on hot air. This is the Wiley e. Coyote situation that I've talked about before, where disassociated from reality, ran off the cliff, the legs are still moving, but there's all air under you. So I would beware if I was invested in the NASDAQ, uh, or if I was invested in uh, just a regular economic stock, econ regular economy type stocks. Obviously, I'm not 100% in cash. We have our positions in uranium, offshore oil drilling, various select sectors like that, some emerging markets. But uh, I will tell you, and I want to caution people, I'll say this as I've said it before, um, if we have a bear market in stocks, uh, if we have a massive drop in a, over you know a couple few weeks, um, most stocks will go down, including those stocks, okay? Now, uh, they will be the first to recover when the Fed comes in and does what they normally do, which is print a bunch of money in, in lower rates. Uh, they'll, they're going to rock it higher. But, uh, you know, don't be naive and think that you're going to hide out. I saw some discussion on even in the Discord this week of the AIA Discord. You know, well, I'm just going to hold through. Be, be aware that you could we could see 30 to 40 percent declines in our stocks in our portfolio. If the market were to just get, you know, dumb, you know, um, uranium stocks are stocks and most stocks go down in a bear market. Um, oil, offshore oil services stocks are stocks and they go down in a bear market. Um, if you had a more gentle glide down, um, then I think that they would probably weather it better. Again, just be prepared for that uh, because that's likely what's going to happen. Go back and look at... I'm not suggesting we're going to have a crash. I don't know the future. Uh, I will tell you that things are really not balanced very well. And uh, a lot of people are looking at a chart like this are really on one side of the canoe. And when the wake up call comes, there could be a massive run to the exits. And uh, again, that will dry liquidity will dry up and people will sell whatever they need to sell. Uh, whether, you know, even gold will go down in the, in the first part of a down downtrend so uh everything just gets sold so you need to prepare yourself for that if you are still holding positions again i don't recommend being 100 percent out of the market because no one like i said before no one can actually tell what's going to happen no no one's a fortune teller it's impossible to know the future 100 percent, and so you have to assign probabilities you know i'm am i putting a ton of new money to work no i've been very clear on that i'm not putting a lot of new money to work i'm just accumulating cash um, in, uh, you know, short-term treasuries and taking my five, five and a quarter, whatever it is, and waiting until I get, you know, a fat pitch to hit. There's no, there's nothing, you know, people, I've been interviewed the last couple months over the months, people's like, what are you looking at now? I'm not looking at, I have, I'm looking at things. I'm looking at REITs. I'm looking at emerging markets, but nothing is really a grand slam yet. You have to, prices haven't come down sufficiently to really pique my interest sufficiently to go all in on something. Okay. There's no uranium five years ago. There's, there's, there's no offshore oil market, you know, uh, set up like there was three years ago. Okay, nothing's looking like that because everything's still pretty expensive. They, my forecast is, is that prices are going to come down massively, that this is going to resolve to the downside. And again, you know, I don't see the Federal Reserve doing anything until we have massive pain uh, in the markets. You know, that means down 30 or 40 percent uh, and uh, in the markets or more and, you know, seeing unemployment go up to five or six percent. Okay. I, that's or if something massive were to break to cause a financial crisis like in the banking system until that happens the fed's not going to do anything and just sit here and like i said the fissures and cracks are just going to continue to spider out and weaken the, the facade and at some point boom you're going to have something's going to happen and trigger a sell-off and then you're going to be in a bear market okay and then when then it's like do we go do we go down 30 or 40 percent in uh you know, a week or two, or is it going to get dragged out over a year? I don't know. Okay. That's why we have the weekly market update. And that's why we are constantly looking at things and assessing things. This is one of the reasons why treasury prices or the prices of, of bonds and rates are going up is because, you know, you had China 
was a major holder of U.S. treasuries. As they would sell things to the U.S., they would get dollars. And then they're like, what are we supposed to do with these trillions of dollars that we're holding? Well, I guess we'll buy U.S. treasuries. That's changed. Okay, that's changed quite a bit, uh, especially over the last, you know, this has been going on for a decade now. They've been selling because of why? Because of the, you know, perceived competitive we're competitors now we're going to go to war with them you know the pentagon's telling people uh that we're going to have a war with china in 2025 the chinese saw what the united states will do uh when they have an enemy what they did to the russians now can they fully divest themselves in you know a week or two no they would crash the market what they can do is uh they can slowly but surely sell these things off or just let that roll off, right? And not buy new securities. And uh, this is another reason, you know, when you have debts going up and our debt is out of control at 8% of GDP, which is kind of like what we were spending during World War II when we were fighting the Japanese and Germans, uh, when we're spending money like crazy, uh, this is what we were relying on as foreign buyers of our debt. And uh, that's, not just China, it's many countries now, and the BRICS are going not not going to be buying U.S. Treasuries, okay? And so what I have said, what I expect, and what other people that are a lot smarter than me, I mean, Luke Groman's been really on top of this for a while. I would suggest listening to uh, his uh, lectures or his interviews. I mean, you really have to kind of pay attention because if you're not familiar with a lot of the concepts, it might be over people's heads. It's not basic stuff. But, uh, you know, at some point, I think it basically distills down to one thing. Either you have to cut spending massively, okay? You have to cut spending massively in the U.S. That means entitlement reform. That means the defense budget needs to be cut massively. This isn't just me saying this politically because that's what I want. This is what has to happen. If it doesn't happen, then the Fed has to monetize the debt. Those are your two choices. What do I think is most likely? I think the Fed will monetize the debt. OK, but it takes a crisis for them to go into that mode. And I think what you're going to see is, again, I go back to what I've said before from something I heard from a Swiss money manager, uh, Felix Zuloff, uh, who said several years ago that he didn't see any reason why the Fed's balance sheet wouldn't be 40 to 50 trillion dollars by the end of this decade. I, I, I think that that's definitely within the realm of possibility. I can I see the you know possibility that the that our U.S. debt, which is 33 trillion, be easily 50 trillion by the end of this decade. And so, what does that do to the dollar when they're monetizing that amount of debt? I'm not sure. Probably not. Won't go up in that, uh, you know, environment. I mean, structurally, the secular decline in the dollar will happen over the years. What happens in six months or 12 months? No one knows. You have intermarket relationships. You have things that are happening, like we do right now, where rates are going up. Rates have went up, rates are going up, and so that's sucking, you know, uh, people into the dollar, the dollar strengthening. I mean, these are these type of intermarket relationships you can have over the short term. But in the long term, there's no way out because they're not going to cut spending. Again, as I've said, there's no constituency out there that wants spending cut. You know, if we have this recession like I'm talking about and a potential hard landing, you have automatic spending stabilizers in the, in the budget, you know, unemployment insurance, different types of relief programs. I mean, there's, you could see the budget deficits, you know, soar in a, sink, in a, in a year or two, just because of the mandated spending that needs to happen during a recession. So this is not helpful. Okay. And I don't think, you know, the neocons and people like that, that run our geopolitical, uh, I don't think they take a lot of this into account. You know, I think that they're, run, again, running off a playbook that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, they just figure, well, it's America. You know, well, that I'm not in the Treasury Department. They'll figure out the sell, way to sell the debt. That's not my department. They're siloed in their own little thing, running their own playbook. And if they do take this into account, it's not given uh, full of, of – uh, uh, they, don't, they don't assign – uh, uh, enough importance to it. And I think that, you know, that's if you're dealing with the Chinese and Russians, you know, the whole world saw what we did to Russia. Okay, we stole their money. It was unprecedented in history, not even during World War II. And you want to talk about where, where foreign government uh, assets seized like that. So uh, you can make the argument that that's the right thing to do. 
that's fine, but you need to understand that actions have reactions, okay? And the reaction is, is with the aggressiveness of the U.S. and using the dollar as a weapon and using its current status in the world as to force things, people to do things that they that the U.S. wants or the rules-based order, people don't have to own treasuries, okay? People don't have to go along with this. And when you demonstrate, like I said, you can only go nuclear once, and that's what happened. And you see since then, you see the Chinese uh, holdings of, you know, U.S. treasuries uh, fall, have fallen off a cliff. They got the message. You know, this is what I keep talking about. This is an excellent chart uh, that got off Twitter. It's from Bloomberg. This shows the maturity profile for U.S. Treasuries. And you see what I've been talking about just over the next several years. Uh, you know, let's, you know, 2023, you have about slightly over half a trillion dollars. It needs to be uh, refinanced. The next year you have over two and a half trillion. I mean, you've got, you can add this up just between now and 2026, you have about $7 trillion in debt that needs to be rolled. Uh, we've talked about this before. Um, this will be a problem in the context of rising deficits and rising and, and higher rates. So now you're going to have to refinance this debt at higher rates that, you know, locks in these higher rates and more interest expense. Again, we've, you know, I'm waiting for the announcement for the, um, from the treasury of the interest payments on the debt exceeding a trillion dollars per year. That should be coming sooner rather than later. Again, here's yields continue to rise. And it's not just now because of the deficits and the Fed raising rates, um, what, there's not demand for these treasuries. And they're having to sell, sell more and more of them. Again, they're going to have to roll debt. Okay, that's coming. And so if, you know, the interest rates basically are a reflection of the supply demand for these for this debt, right? And so to entice people to buy it, and to compensate them for the anticipated inflation that may or may that that looks like it may be baked in going forward, people demand a higher interest rate, right? And you know, again, remember we just had one of the rating agencies not too long ago downgrade the U.S. debt. That's going to continue, okay? Now it'll take longer than it should. I mean, the U.S. is functionally bankrupt, but uh, you know, because those are captured. Uh, businesses, those rating agencies, but it'll be obvious to those that are to everyone. Okay. And then, you know, downgrades will continue and rates will go up. And uh, so again, you either have to cut spending massively, which would cause a massive recession slash depression in the United States because government spending now is so high and so much a part of the U S economy that, you know, you know, used to have people say that they were, we could grow our way out of it. It's almost to the point now where it, it can't, you've crossed the Rubicon and now it's set in stone what's going to happen. So eventually what will happen is to buy this debt. Um, you know, you have Jamie Dimon out. Eventually the Fed will come in and buy the debt. They will have no choice. They'll be the buyer of last resort. Um, and then you, you know, I was getting ready to mention, you got people like Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan talking about 7% interest rates. Do you think that this over debt economy can survive with 7% interest rates? Well, people will say, well, we're already at over 5%. What's the problem? Well, what's the problem? Look at the 30 year mortgages. I think I've saw 30 year mortgages crack 8% handle last week in certain locale. I think Bank of America had 30, 30 year mortgages. Who's, who's buying a house with an 8% interest rate with the highest housing prices of all time? So everything keys off these rates, guys. And it just changes, you know, again, with an over-indebted economy, with an over-indebted society, you know, this doesn't work with these high rates. So uh, more to come on this. We haven't seen big problem yet, but that doesn't mean it's not coming. So you see that, you know, as rates have went up since May, oops, you, you know, you've had basically the dollar, you know, has been increasing, right? Because people are going to, as it's very complicated, but suffice to say, 
that, uh, you know, when you look at rates here compared to other places, you get a better return. It's still the U.S. You have a lot of uh, uh, people have this perception that we have the rule of law, that we're the, you know, you've heard all the arguments before. And so money flows into the dollar. And when people, you know, into bank deposits, into treasuries, into all kinds of do dollar based assets, this is what you have, right? You have the dollar uh basically increasing you see the bottom but the dollar basically was in a decline it was basically as as the fed decided to start raising rates the dollar strengthened over uh that time of course it gets overbought like i said you have you have intermarket relationships you know people were thinking well you know i mean you only you don't go straight up and so now we had this retrenchment in the dollar um and now we're you know we're back we're back rallying. I mean, this is rallying hard over the last, you know, couple months. It's overbought now in the short term. But uh, these these are the intermarket relationships I talk about. As rates go up, basically the dollar goes up, right? Uh, and gold goes down. Okay. I mean, these things. People ask me. I want to talk a little bit about this because I think gold is going to represent an excellent opportunity. You know, gold held in fairly well um, as the dollar kind of was going up you know the, the the gold gold usually does well in an environment of crisis yes obviously but it also uh inner market type relationship is based on interest rates real rates what's real rates well it's you know interest rates uh, minus the inflation rate gives you the real rate of okay so if you have negative real rates that's good for gold okay that's when the inflation rate is above the interest rate on the 10 year. Um, and that means you're not getting a positive return based on inflation. So gold does well. It doesn't even have to be negative. If, as long as rates are trending in the negative direction, trending, real rates are trending down and heading towards negative. That's usually when the rally will start in gold. Um, so you see that as rates have went up recently, gold's got smacked around just as the dollars went up. I mean, uh, there's correlations. You can look them up. I don't know like what they are, 80% correlated, 90%. I, I don't know exactly. I probably need to go do the research. I used to have it in a file. I used to track stuff like this. Um, I just don't do it anymore. But understand at the basic high level that there are intermarket relationships. And so, you know, with an expectation that I have that the economy will eventually weaken and necessitate the Fed to come in and lower rates, you know, when they lower rates, they don't just lower them like, you know, a quarter percent, they, they start knocking them down pretty quick, meeting after meeting, right? It takes, it's like an escalator going up on the rates and then an elevator coming down. And so you can very, that would be the time to buy gold when we know for sure that the Fed is entering a rate cutting cycle and we will see, you know, rates um, come down uh, and hopefully real rates would be trending even negative uh, or, or being negative at that point. I don't know. But uh, I think in that context, you're going to see all commodities rip when the, you know, the next time the Fed has to get activated it goes back to Cuppy's Project Zimbabwe. Uh, I know it's supposed to be humorous, but it's not. And I think that you'll see, you know, so am I, am I buying, you know, the problem is, is you'll notice that I don't have any gold stocks in the portfolio. I've, I don't think I've ever had a gold stock in the portfolio. Gold, gold's very, been very difficult for me to make money in. And you really have to, be in the right environment and we're not in that environment right now uh do i have some gold stocks in my personal portfolio yes i have some junior mining stocks in my personal portfolio as speculations but these are not like random companies i just picked these are companies with drills turning that are building resources that i that are run by people that know what they're doing you know and uh have the potential to be acquired by a larger company uh, and have actually a mining, uh, 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 a deposit that can be mined, right? And, uh, you know, I'm talking about a company like Newfound Gold, for example. I'm talking about a company like Goliath, where you just had Rob McEwen come in with Crescat and, you know, do a big uh, injection there. Am I recommending them? No, I have other ones. I have about a half dozen of these junior resource, junior gold explorers, uh, that I think, you know, I just have a small 
taste of just so I can follow them. I'm not, I haven't went in whole hog. Things are very hard to make money in. You really have to catch them at the right spots. But I do think there is an opportunity coming uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, again, when the Fed reverses course and they go back into a rate cutting cycle. You know, talking about the rate cutting cycle, you know, I track internationally basically most of the central banks in the world. And what I have noticed is over the summer, we started seeing more and more, we started moving to from a rate raising cycle to a tight, from a tightening type cycle worldwide to a neutral cycle around July and August, where we were seeing just as many central banks cut rates as raise rates. And last month, September, when I did the calculation, was the first month that we've seen in probably a couple of years where uh, the preponderance of central banks around the world is now cutting rates. And so I've said it before, we've topped out on the rate cycle, on the tightening cycle. Um, you're going to see a lot of the central banks that were at the forefront of raising rates well before the EU or the US are now in rate cutting cycles. Those are at the margin. They're not going to like affect the whole world's liquidity massively, but they're at the margin. And what I'm that's what I'm saying is we are we are moving probably from a tightening cycle. We're now in a, you know, entering a neutral type cycle where um, we're kind of evening out. But the big heavy guns in the world, the big central banks, will eventually be cutting rates. Uh, I think that they have reached, the U.S. has probably maybe got one more in them. That's what Mr. Powell said. But uh, unless you have some massive takeoff in inflation uh, over the next, you know, whatever, I think as the economy weakens, as the lag effect of previous rating, rate raising cycle uh, continues to, uh, you know, tighten the screws on the economy, uh, we, we've probably reached the the highest level. So it's not time to buy gold. It's time to put your list together of things you're interested in, because I think there will be an opportunity. And I think the next time that the Fed cuts rates, we'll make all time highs in gold. But this isn't like a very good looking chart, guys. And again, you need to study these intermarket relationships so you can understand, you know, as a dollar goes up, gold goes down, you know, as rates go up, gold goes down. Why does gold go down? Gold does, why is it so tied to rate interest rates? Gold doesn't pay any kind of dividend or doesn't have a, an interest rate. And so when you have positive real rates, you're getting a positive return relative to inflation. Why would people put, why would big money go into gold? They go into interest bearing uh, uh, type situations because um, you're getting a positive return with inflation. When you're in a negative interest rate environment or you're heading there and you're going to stay there for a while, then people start selling the interest bearing because you're losing money then, right? You know, if you have, when, when, if you have a locked in 3% 30-year mortgage, okay, and the inflation rates above what your interest is, um, you know, your the inflation rate is basically you know killing whoever's holding that mortgage. They're upside down on it on on a real return basis. Okay, I'm not going to get into. I mean, that's just the basics. Okay, that's why you know uh, that's why you're seeing all this money flow into short term treasuries. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if the average long term return in the S and P is what eight and a half or nine percent which it is over time, over the history, look it up. Um, not a hundred percent, not a thousand percent a year. You know, the, the outliers that we get in the portfolio, where we have stocks that are up hundreds of percent. Those are outliers. That's not normal. If you put your money in the S and P and reinvest the dividends, I think your return would be eight and a half or 9%. So if you can get five and a quarter in a risk-free treasury bill, you're capturing approximately, you know, more, Two thirds, half to two thirds of the long term return in the S and P with no risk. That's why you know people are in cash. I think cash is the best thing to sit in until we get a clear indication of what's happening with the economy and with you know rates. So I just wanted to point this out that you know I I do hold gold physically as a insurance policy against central bank and government malfeasance. I've said that before. Uh, I think everybody should have a certain amount of physical gold for that reason or silver, whatever, what have you. Um, I've had people 
email me and ask me, you know, how should they buy gold? You know, make sure that you are, you know, maybe I'll do a video on that or, or some explanation on that. Cause you know, but a lot of people think it's the barbarous relic. It has no relevance, but uh, you know, again, throughout the last 500 years of basically human history, it's been used as money. And I don't think it's going to get it, you know, changed now. Again, when, when we have this uh, reliquification, when we enter this next loose cycle, loosening cycle, whatever you want to call it, credit expansion cycle, that's we're probably going to be entering sooner rather than later, then all this stuff's going to rip because you can't, you can create all the currency units you want, but you can't create more gold. Men have to go into the ground and toil. And we know from history that the gold supply with all of that effort and all of that energy that's put into it can only yield about, you know, a half a percent to a percent growth in, uh, you know, the total amount of gold. So if you're, if you're raising the amount of dollars by 10 or 20 percent, uh, then the gold price goes up. Same thing with oil, same thing with food. Um, these are basic concepts. So. And that's, that's why you have these intermarket relationships you need to be aware of. For some young, young enterprising youth that's listening to this, this is a good exercise maybe for you to go out and discover what these correlations have been historically. Again, we've talked about the junk, junk bond spreads, credit spreads in the move index. You know, the move index is the, uh, this, this volatility index for bonds. And again, you know, maybe we're slightly turning up now this is uh you know we we haven't seen with this amount of volatility previously we've seen spreads blow out we haven't seen that yet um this is very strange to me but again as long as people can make their payments at these companies and make their interest rate payments they're not going to go into default does that change going forward i suspect it does why? Many companies are not profitable. Around one third Russell 2000 companies aren't profitable. We're supposed to be like, you know, in an expansion, guys. This is near the highest level in data, highest level in the data going back to 1985. Okay. So, you know, you see these recessions, you know, after the recession, you see the, the, um, as it peaks, the amount of companies that are not profitable. Look, we're at like levels not seen in you know 40 years and so we go back to how many of these companies have junk debt how many of them are not going to be able to make the payments you know this all worked when you could get more debt or issue equity whatever to keep the lights on is that come to an end that's been my suspicion and so we'll see what happens uh this is not positive It's not just in the U.S. Look at look at Germany's uh, yields on uh, their debt on their ten-year uh, yield. So you're back at levels of 2001. Um, I'm not suggesting anything about this. I'm not picking on Germany. I'm just pointing this out. Um, this is a reflection of the inflation that they're experiencing there, it's mostly tied to the fact that they. Uh, allow the U.S. to blow up their cheap energy coming into the country from Russia via the Nord Stream pipeline. So, yeah, um, I think that, you know, we just saw a government in, you know, Slovakia come to power that is basically kind of an anti-EU situation um, and also ran on a for, ran on a platform basically of no more support for this war in Ukraine. So now you have Hungary and Slovakia, which are members of NATO and the EU. Um, and I think more is coming. Um, you just saw recently in Germany more attacks. Uh, somebody tried to inject something into one of the AFD's uh, politicians there. You're going to see a lot of political turmoil, I think, because the economic turmoil leads to social and political turmoil. Um, the immigration situation in the U.S. is boiled over um, now to the point where the Biden administration is going to go back and start rebuilding the wall. <laughs> Again, this is a situation that I, I, I really crack up about. These people have no political philosophies, okay? They don't believe in anything except for staying in power. And because of the immigration situation and people pouring across the border in the millions, 
Um, people are aggravated. This is something that if you run on in the U.S., you will get power. And you have to be willing to stand in the breach while you're called a racist and every name under the, a xenophobe, a nationalist, all these ridiculous situations. With the, that, that's what you're saying for like 70% of the people. It's across the board. People, you see what's happening in these cities in, in the north. Nobody wants unfettered immigration, okay, where you just open the border and all these people pour across. So who voted for this? Who enabled this? It's the same thing in Europe, okay? You see these boats, just, you know, NGOs that are created just to do this. You're seeing it. I see it on TikTok and, on, you know, these people like in Sicily and southern Italy don't play around. I mean, these immigrants act up. Uh, or go in and push an old lady or something, and they take a beat down. They, they, I've seen it many, many times, okay? They don't play around with these people. They don't want them there. And this is a winning thing for politicians, okay? And uh, so that's why, you know, it's gotten so bad now that the Biden administration, you know, during the election, Mr. Biden said that he was going to shut, you know, all that work down. As a matter of fact, I know the contractor, one of the contractors that was working on it, and they were they were told just to keep all their equipment out there. They were still being paid. They got paid off, even though they didn't do any work. They honored the contracts. They sold off the material or just let it sit out and, and rot. And so, you know, more waste, fraud, and abuse because these people don't believe in anything politically, okay, except for staying in power. And it was politically convenient to be against the Trump administration. And, and you know, and then this thing is now swinging the other way. Again, you look at any poll. OK, across the board, people don't want open borders and people just pouring in here. They don't want it. And you see what's happening even in these liberal so-called sanctuary cities. It's real easy to, you know, um, genuflect and, you know, play the role and say a bunch and talk big. And then when you actually have to support all this and the people show up. Well, now they don't want them. I mean, and they're pretty, you know, we've went over this before. So I think. All of this stuff is tying together. I think if the economy does go into a deep recession, which is possible in my view, then you're going to have more political chaos, more social chaos. Um, you know, the pressure is building, okay, uh, 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 on this pressure cooker. So we'll see. Uh, obviously, it's not conducive to, like, you know, economic, you know, prosperity. Let's put it that way when you have a bunch of political and social turmoil so again you know um this is just a tweet you can look up the news items uh basically makes the the point white house to lift sanctions on venezuela white house ready to lift sanctions on venezuela so the oppressive regime can pump more oil of course because they want oil prices down there's no spr the SPR has been drained. Now, luckily for the administration, oil dropped about 10 bucks a barrel over the last couple of weeks. So that takes the pressure off. But the last thing that this administration needs going into election year is gasoline over $4 a gallon. So we will see what happens with demand. Um, again, uh, I feel pretty good about the oil stocks that I have as long as the you know OPEC plus is going to keep their voluntary cuts in place through the end of the year. And now we have, like I said, you have a rate cutting cycle beginning around the world. Uh, we're already seeing economic growth recover in some places. Oil demand's going up, but we're seeing resistance to higher prices. Uh, for example, I saw the, I think it was the Indian Minister of um, Energy come out and say that oil prices are too high. And they're always going to say that, right? Um, you saw the fact that Nigeria got rid of fuel subsidies and oil, you know, 10, I think it was costing Nigeria 10 billion a year. Um, they couldn't afford it. And oil gasoline demand dropped by 27% after that. But these things recover over time, right? And just because what happens in Nigeria is not going to affect the oil market in, to in totality. Uh, but these are at the margin type situations. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not convinced that, uh, you know, a lot of people maybe got ahead of themselves. So again, with the oil market, I'm still bullish long-term just because of the, over this decade, just because what I think is the underinvestment situation and the increases in demand that are going to happen. Uh, but again, you know, I don't know what's going to happen week to week or month to month or quarter to quarter. It's impossible to know. Anybody that says they know is, uh, 
well, I mean, they should be trading it successfully then. So I'm not seeing a lot of people able to do that. Uh, I just look at try to look at the overall trend. But this is, again, another ploy to try to keep gasoline, get this cheap Venezuelan crude in here. Uh, because we want to get, we have to keep oil prices down. We can't go into the election with four or five dollar gasoline. Um, you saw in California, they've already, I think, the, they changed the 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 regulations on the blending so they could uh, make it easier for prices to go down. They'll do whatever they have to do. There's no energy policy in the U.S. Right? There's no coherent energy policy anywhere in the West that I can see. Um, it's just a uh, politically motivated um and if gas prices go up that's what they'll do they'll they'll you know re lessen sanctions on iran lessen sanctions on venezuela pump more oil they certainly won't encourage oil production here in the united states uh they certainly won't uh they're doing exactly the opposite right by putting more and more areas off limits canceling leases not approving pipelines it, we've talked about this before. So this is all political as it usually is. And uh, running policy, you know, these policymakers should be doing things for what's best for the most people in the country. And that's not how things are. I don't want to go off on another one of these type of conversations. I'm just pointing this out. So uh, we, we depends on what we'll see. Now, the ability to Venezuela to actually raise production, well, I mean, the place has been under sanctions for so long and, and, and that industry has been in decline. But if you get, you know, good companies there like Chevron and stuff, which is down there, and if they have the ability and they're allowed to do what they do, I mean, they'll apply the techniques and they'll, they'll raise production. But uh, uh, these things take time. And like I said, watch what happens with the oil price uh, in the context of interest rate. I mean, all these things tie together, right? So... Having talking about this, we have Exxon to acquire Pioneer Natural Resources, Pioneer being one of the premier Permian uh, companies that has uh, their assets in the Permian. Um, Exxon to acquire them. This is uh, uh, look, being looked at as possibly, and we've had continuous consolidation um, under the radar there. And this is just a big example. This is a $60 billion deal. It says the oil majors in talks to acquire Pioneer Natural Resources in a $60 billion deal that, if completed, would become a watershed moment in the history of shale. Woods has been on the lookout. This Woods is the uh, CEO of Exxon for purchases in the Permian, a vast area sp spanning Texas and New Mexico for years. But Exxon's finances were hit hard by the pandemic, limiting opportunities to strike a deal. Of course, that changed in the last year because they had like record cash flow last year, $55 billion or something like this at Exxon. The Permian, where land ownership is fragmented, is particularly compelling to players with the financial heft to swallow rivals. And with concerns mounting about dwindling output from top-tier well sites, we can expect more consolidation to follow. What I think this is interesting about is if uh, if you listen to the CEO of Pioneer, they were not going to like raise their... You know, they were off the drill, baby drill thing. They were going to just focus on shareholder returns, paying down debt, that type of thing. And they had been saying over the last year and a half or so that, you know, they weren't going to, that they had a certain amount of runway of drillable um, locations and they could run it down pretty quick or they could, you know, do it in a more managed way and still increase production slightly each year, but focus on returns to shareholders. Now, if Exxon comes in, they may be more inclined just to, you know, drill it all off and, and make a bunch of money. So I think this is interesting. You know, not only is Exxon, Exxon is one of the few companies that didn't succumb to the ESG nonsense and to the, you know, ankle biting of these idiots that get one or two shares and then go raise a bunch of cane at the, uh, you know, they did have that one outfit come in and they got some board members on the board, but I don't think it was sufficient for them to really change their what they were doing. You know, it's interesting. They bought Denbury for that extensive um, Denbury resource has extensive CO2 pipeline system through Texas, Louisiana. It's being expanded. But that, you know, they could say, well, that's 
for us to pump CO2 into the ground. Yeah, but the CO2 is pumped in the ground for an enhanced oil recovery. That's what Denbury's basically main business was, was enhanced oil field recovery from older fields by using CO2 uh, injection and pushing, um, you know, molecules of oil to the wellhead. So do most people know that? No, they don't know anything. So they certainly don't know that. And so Exxon can say, well, we're putting CO2, sequestering it. And then, you know, if you read further, you understand, well, you sequester the CO2 and use it as an enhanced oil field recovery technique, which has been done for years, by the way. It's nothing new. So I just wanted to show this chart. This is electricity production in France. It shows you what you can do. Um, you see the uh, when basically after the oil embargoes that the Arabs put in during the Yom Kippur War situation that France committed to nuclear energy and you see what they were able to do with nuclear energy. This is what the United States should be doing. Shouldn't be wasting our time and money with intermittent resources. We should be doing the same thing here that the French did. And it was done over a period of a couple, you know, a couple few, you do it over a decade. You make this big push, you get up there, this, do a JFK moon type speech, but you say you're going to do this with nuclear energy. And if you want to create jobs, if you want STEM, if you want engineering, if you want manufacturing, this is how you, this is perfect mechanism for to do that in an industrial policy. And it hits all the bases for the environmentalists, CO2 reduction, for people who want economic growth and the policymakers to make things uh, less uh, dependent on foreign sources. And we have, the United States has a tremendous amount of remaining resources of uranium. We could be doing a entire uranium industry and, you know, basically exporting that technology to the rest of the world. Instead, you know, we're playing around with, uh, you know, tinker toys, solar and wind, and that's not going to really get us where we need to go uh, on a large scale. So I just wanted to show this because it's a visual representation of what you, what you can do if you set your mind to it. And uh, they haven't had any nuclear accidents in France. Yes, they've had some issues here and there around, you know, but I mean, this, there's, you know, the adult person understands that there's trade-offs in life. Nothing is like perfect. No, no energy source, no decision you make. Everything has pros and cons. So I just wanted to show this because I think it's illustrative. So this is just a chart I picked up. It's kind of a fun thing. I don't know. I, I'm not saying anything about this, but this is like the uh, seasonality for Cameco, which is you know one of the largest uranium producers in the world. Uh, basically, October through the end of the year typically has been the best part of the year uh, seasonality-wise for Cameco stock. Does that mean that Cameco stock is going to go up during this period, this fourth quarter? I have no idea. I'm just pointing this out. I thought it was kind of an interesting. We've already had a pretty decent run, and you see that it's come off boil, right? We had all this excitement coming out of the WNA. A lot of money came into the market, and then all of a sudden, the news flow kind of, it kind of like petered out the rocket fuel, right? Because you don't have that. I just still don't think you've had that large institutional money come in yet. And so you had a bunch of retail come back in. It was a new shiny object again. Prices got overbought, but then we'll just have to see what happens going forward. Um, I think it's kind of like climbing a mountain, right? You know, with the uranium spot price, everybody focuses on that when most of the action is in the term markets and the contracts being signed. But the problem is, is that, again, um, we don't have line of sight to that because those contracts are protected under NDAs and people don't want that information out there. It leaks out over time, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, I think uh, as Cuppy said, he got um, interviewed by the market huddle guys, uh, Kevin Muir, and he was just like saying something similar. So it's just like, you know, what would happen if Saudi Arabia or if OPEC said yes tomorrow or on Monday, we're cutting uranium or oil production by, you know, 10 or 20 percent? I mean, the oil price would rocket higher because there's price discovery right then. It's not the same in the uranium market. The information is so is very opaque and it's hard to really know what the real deficits are. The deficits are there for sure, but are they 20 million a year, 40 million a year? It's hard to determine, hard to figure out. But I think eventually, it uh, doesn't matter 
uh, you just stay the course here and buy on dips. That's what I keep telling people uh, with respect to the uranium market. I mean, uh, you stand aside when you have these big runs like we've recently had. You say, okay, well, you know, it's uh, two steps forward, one step back, like climbing a mountain. It's slow going, but uh, we're just inching further, closer and closer to the peak. Wanted to bring this up, uh, you know, I don't want to rag on it too much, but I, I find this amusing. You know, people want to rant and rave, you know, let's go and this is the biggest election of all time and we have to do this or, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not, <laughs> you know what my feelings are about the political class, parasitic class. I thought this was interesting. Diane Feinstein, you know, died a couple few weeks ago. And I just thought it was funny because, you know, what's what was, you know, we're supposed to have all this respect. Let's lower the flag. These people are crooks. These people are grifters. These people are parasites. Okay. And it says, you know, she's leaving behind a massive hundred million dollar plus portfolio to her four daughters. A public servant on a six figure salary who was worth eight figures. Remarkable. Here is what Diane Feinstein left behind. A $60 million private jet, a $21 million San Francisco mansion, a $7.4 million Washington, D.C. home, a $5 million Hawaii home, and $70 million in cash in the bank. Ex ex experts estimate her personal net worth was over $70 million. Washington is beyond corrupt. Absolutely. That's all I'm going to say about it. Not, there's no editorial needed. If you don't get it, you're not going to get it. It's just that simple. We, we are just not going to be able to to discuss this because you don't get it those people are not there for you they're there for them and their donors figure it out and once you've acknowledged that then you have no use for the political class and for any of this nonsense that just distracts people from the real issues that's my opinion okay guys that's it for this week um again i think we're gonna have a lot of volatility rig for heavy weather there's a good chance uh well I think that the market's going to be weak uh, coming up. Uh, I don't see what the impetus is for higher stock prices. If we have a, you know, over a six or eight week period, a 30% decline, then the portfolio will be down, but it won't be down as much. And then when the reversal comes in liquidity, which will happen, uh, the Fed will come in. That's what they do. That's the playbook that they run. Then the companies that we hold will react uh, to the upside. Now, I'm not forecasting that. I certainly have no line of sight or crystal ball. I'm just pointing this out that if stocks go down, you know, the stocks in the portfolio are stocks. They'll likely go down too. Uh, in a stock market, bear market, or crash, call it that if you would like, whatever you want to call it, um, 90 to 95% of the stocks go down. It's just a, a liquidity event. It's nothing. It should be a buying opportunity for you if you have cash. And so be you're at we're at a very kind of dangerous point here of whether or not people should put new money to work you should know what the ideas are this is the time to get yourself educated if you're just new to uranium if you're new to the some of these other things that we've talked about make sure you fully understand it so that when the bargains present themselves which i suspect they will you can come in and buy them okay i think and for existing holders each person's gonna have to decide for themselves what they want to do or can do. Some people are traders. I don't trade. I'm not a trader. I've not been successful. Um, and so you'll have to decide if you want to sell and try to get back in. Those are a bunch of decisions I don't want to make. I just hold for the long-term secular move. It's worked for me. And I buy on dips. As far as gold goes, I'm becoming more interested, but I need to see a, a new um, easing cycle, which is going to force... Um, real rates down, uh, which is beneficial for gold. But I do I, I do have my buying list, and I think there is going to be a, a possibility uh, that we're going to see new all-time highs in the gold in gold when we eventually get into this new easing cycle. So we'll see. Uh, that's kind of how I'm looking at it right now. That's it for this week. Appreciate the patronage. Appreciate the viewership. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.